So today I want to talk about Senator Joe Manchin and the problems of bipartisanship. Joe Manchin represents a new potential roadblock to getting things done. He is stepping in at, you know, where Mitch McConnell was and taking the place of the person who will prevent anything from getting done. So who is Joe Manchin? Well, he's a senator that is of the Democratic Party who represents West Virginia, which has become a very red state over the years. Now, Manchin is a Democrat, but he is by far the most conservative member of the Democratic Senate, by far, to such an extent that he votes along Republican lines almost as much as he votes along Democratic lines. He has taken a strong stance against abortion. He has had stances against LGBT rights, including protections for LGBT people. And he's had terrible views on climate change by calling for, you know, a balance between our economy and the uh, environment. A position that, of course, is problematic when we keep putting forward things that protect economy and not enough things are getting done to actually address the environment. In general, uh, you know, this country has a problem where right-wing perspectives dominate, and his position is one that provides power to the status quo and especially to corporate donors at the cost of working class people. While he claims to be the hero of the working class and defending coal miners and defending truck drivers in his home state of West Virginia, he is the person who will more than likely represent the ability to stifle any progressive policies that the left tries to put forward. And this will include COVID relief and uh, anything that is required during this pandemic economy. He will be the new Mitch McConnell when we talk about what is stopping things from happening. Um, and even though Manchin has agreed to the budget reconciliation process, which if you're not familiar with, basically it's a way that the Democrats can focus on budget-oriented policy to eliminate the filibuster in the Senate. So instead of requiring 60 votes, we now require 50, which positions Manchin in a very convenient spot, being the most conservative member of the Democratic Party. You know, that puts him in a position of power and gives him leverage. And in that position of power and leverage, instead of allying with the Democrats across the board, his position has been one where he talks about bipartisanship. You know, and in order to display that, I have a clip from him talking about bipartisanship, and I just want to show that off very quickly. In December, if you recall. Okay. We don't Let want me to... just start that over. Would you support a budget resolution then that the Speaker Pelosi and Senator Schumer just jointly filed yesterday? The, the resolution I'm going to support this process moves forward. I will only support moving in a, in a bipartisan way. That means an open process. I've been very clear about that. <clears throat> but it's urgent that basically that, that is the only way that we can get assured to get a COVID package. Let's say that we start debating. I understand the pitfalls of debating. Sometimes the last one went nine months before we broke the logjam in December, if you recall. Okay? We don't want this to go. We can't afford. So we'll go down this and have things in place, but it's going to be a bipartisan input. That's what we're committed to. Would you say? So as you heard, uh, Manchin is essentially, you know, in this position where he's talking about bipartisanship. And bipartisanship... And this is something he's talked about for years as a senator, going all the way back to as far back as 2012 um, under the Obama administration. Bipartisanship is, again, a codified way of saying, give the Republicans everything they want for very little in return, if nothing in return. If that's at, you know, you know, one side of it, the other side of it is it allows stalling to happen so that issues never actually get done. You know, it allows time to pass until more conservative perspectives can rise to power and things actually get done just on the Republican side of things. You know, the Republicans spent years hammering through policies, putting the Trump uh, Supreme Court candidates through. And where was Joe Manchin to ask the Republicans for bipartisanship in return? Where was the call for bipartisanship when things 
were going purely in the Republicans' way, and they, you know, overwhelmingly destroyed the filibuster in so many instances. You know, this bipartisan thing, this bipartisan language, only pops up when the Democrats are in power. And it is, again, a way to keep the status quo in place and make sure nothing moves forward. And Manchin recognizes his position of power, recognizes where he is in terms of leverage, and that the Democrats have to go through him now in order to get anything done. He is now a point of position and power, and he does not represent the people. He represents a good number of corporate interests, while, again, guising himself as a person of the people. And I'm going to be real. You know, when we look at Manchin's um, proposals around, you know, policy and what we're looking at in terms of the pandemic, he has advocated for um, the stimulus checks to, quote, be more targeted to those in need. He suggested that he wouldn't agree to $350 billion in state and local funding, and he said he doesn't support raising the federal minimum wage from $7.25 to $15 an hour. Now, I need to break this down. First and foremost, targeting to those in need means less people getting access to that. It doesn't necessarily mean making sure poor people get more or that they get what's required. It is really kind of um, a misdirection because right now there's a lot of people at different economic levels who need. And the idea of targeting it is usually around the idea of making sure poor people get the minimum wage and that people who might be worse off with slightly higher incomes end up getting, you know, screwed out of money. And you keep lowering that bar and lowering that bar. Because right now there are people suffering from all different economic levels. This this has ruined, this pandemic has ruined a lot of people's lives, has made things very difficult across the board. And right now, If he actually meant targeting and he actually meant addressing the systemic issues and he was talking about wealth redistribution and, um, you know, funneling money from the wealthy organizations down into people, I could get on board with that kind of targeting. But the type of targeting he's talking about is a misdirection as far as I understand it and as far as I'm concerned. Further, the $350 billion going to state and local funding what is wrong with that? Like, some of the states are using it to their needs and to address the specific concerns. My issue is states like Florida, and I guess I agree on that particular point of things. And again, you know, those two points can seem very reasonable, very moderate, and very bipartisan, but he's not being bipartisan. He is, again, appealing to conservative perspectives. And we see that specifically when he talks about the federal minimum wage not being raised from seven twenty-five to $15 an hour. There is absolutely no reason why we cannot reach a point of $15 an hour. Furthermore, I just need to emphasize this, even though this isn't specifically referring to Manchin when we talk about the Republicans not playing well with the situation. Um, Press Secretary Jen um, uh, Psaki um, told reporters on Tuesday that the president is sticking to his proposal uh, of $1,400 direct payments, even though the Republican lawmaker, lawmakers are now pushing for $1,000 stimulus checks. You know, they already prevented any sort of significant reform under McConnell, and now they're trying to lower it even more. And these are the groups that, you know, um, Manchin wants to, you know, claim is someone we should appeal to in bipartisanship. And that's really the problem across the board. Like, we keep appealing to this more and more conservative perspective until nothing actually gets done that is substantial. And, you know, we cannot afford, like Manchin said, another nine-month wait. We can't afford to wait until the Republicans decide to get their stuff together to get stuff done. As we, sh- as I just showed off, they are not interested in any sort of actual compromise that's going to mean anything for people. And we on the left already know that Biden's $1,400 check is not enough. You know, they promised 2,000, you know, and they weasel their way out of it down to the 1,400 amount to the point that they have some people defending that $1,400 amount. And that check was supposed to arrive over a month ago. You know, if it was back payment for that previous check, that $600 check, you know, where was 
that perspective moving forward. And, you know, Kamala Harris last year was the one advoc advocating with Bernie Sanders for $2,000 checks every single month. Where has that Democratic Party gone now that they're in the position of power? And one could argue Manchin is the one upholding it, but I don't hear the rest of the Democratic Party speaking out and being like, no, 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 we really need these $2,000 checks. Please, somebody deal with Manchin. They're not trying to take the steps. And honestly, it just feels at the end of the day like they don't care for the most part. And I'm not talking specifically about the ones who are calling it out and who are saying we need this. You know, there's a limited amount of power within each representative. So I can get behind the people who are saying, yes, we need relief, but what do you want us to do about it? What I can't get behind is someone like Manchin, who is providing the new wall like McConnell did. And, you know, when you look at all of this, and you look at the fact that we've had a situation in the United States where we've needed that stimulus, we've needed consistent shutdowns for almost 10 months, you know, this position of compromise and this stuff getting completely whittled down just represents people suffering at this point. The Republicans in Congress are in bad faith. The Republicans have always shown themselves to be in bad faith. And yet, you know, they used, again, the same type of anti-filibuster methods to pass through so much stuff. And they threatened it with so much more that if the Democrats didn't play nice, that they would do it. That's not a call to bipartisanship. That's do what we say or, you know, we're just going to make it completely what we say. That's what the Democrats need to be doing right now. They are the majority. And Manchin should be getting on board with that, not fighting against that. And, you know, just to show things um, as they are, the Democrats... Um, and Republicans going back and forth on this. When the Democrats put forward this budget reconciliation process, McConnell had the nerve to say the following. We'll, we'll go through the whole thing. We welcome your ideas, your inputs, your revisions. We welcome cooperation. There is nothing about the process of a budget resolution or reconciliation, for that matter, that forecloses the possibility of bipartisanship, Schumer said. Despite this overture by Schumer, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said on Tuesday that Democrats had chosen a partisan path by proceeding with the budget resolution. And this is the language they'll constantly keep throwing out. Oh, well, they're not playing fair. And they're not, they're just not playing nice. How long are we going to keep letting this happen while people are starving and suffering and choosing between food and medicine and everything else? You know, people are choosing between how to pay different bills in their lives and they can't you know, make ends meet, and they're not able to sustain themselves. And we're sitting here talking about this. There's a looming economic crisis that's going to burst when we hit September or October, whenever the Democrats have decided that, um, you know, the housing crisis is going to become a real issue again. And that's when we'll debate again and we'll capitulate to more Republican ideas. People need to start calling out their senators and their representatives. And don't attack the ones that are already on your side with this stuff. Call them into account if they back off later. But call out the ones who are stopping you and standing in your way. Mansion first and foremost. Maybe some of the more moderate, you know, Republicans, which of course is still far too conservative. Maybe people need to start calling them into question. Start calling them up. Call up your representatives. Call up your senators. Get them into account. And while we're doing this, we need to start coming up with alternate ideas. Because this system is broken and it is not working at all. And Manchin is a complete representation of that at this point. And I think the saddest part about Manchin's position is that Republican, the Republican governor of West Virginia, Jim Justice, actually supports relief. A Republican governor supports the relief that a senator is from the same state who represents himself as a Democrat isn't necessarily going to back up. And while I don't agree with Jim Justice, he like I don't he doesn't strike me as someone that, you know, is in any way left and I probably don't agree with him on most issues. He is talking about relief for people and I think his words are worth looking at in this context. 
So when Jim Justice was asked, uh, speaking about the stimulus package in Congress, you said, if we throw away some money right now, so what? That doesn't sound very Republican. His response was, we absolutely need to quit thinking first and foremost, what is the right Republican or Democrat thing to do? I've been a business guy all my life, and I know that when you have a real problem, you can't cut your way out of the problem. Too often we try to skinny everything down and not fund it properly. If we ended up wasting a few dollars and it jump-started the economy and it helped all those that were out there, as many as we can, that are really hurting, would we not be one heck of a lot better than trying to just match the shoe size to the foot and understanding the shoe size to where you couldn't even walk? I would a whole lot rather give somebody a pair of shoes that was a little too big than a pair of shoes that was too small to put on their feet. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying that Manchin's call to, you know, um, what was it, the language he used, exactly, targeting those in need. That's the kind of issue we run into with phrases like targeting those who are in need, because it ends up missing the mark. And sometimes, instead of it being too large, it can become too small and it don't reach enough people. And, you know, he even said about the difference between $1,000 and $1,400, this being the governor. I just keep uh, going back to the exact same thing, and it's this. At the end of the day, if we overdo it a little, um, a downside risk is minimal. If we underdo it, a downside risk is enormous. You know, and so Manchin really needs to take this into account. You know, what his own governor is saying, because this Republican, you know, governor is right about this one particular issue. We cannot afford to miss the mark, you know, on one stimulus, let alone, you know, any of them. And, you know, he's right about, again, this one particular instance. But this needs to be done, like, in a much wider fashion. We need to be pushing for a lot more reform. And, you know, with that said, you know, things like a $15 minimum wage are still not enough for a lot of people in a lot of locations across the country. You know, we need to start hitting a point where we stop trying to put poor people at the absolute minimum that they can survive on and start allowing for people to thrive in this society. There's enough wealth for everybody to have. It doesn't need to be concentrated in the hands of a very few amount of people. And like I said, while I probably don't agree with Jim Justice on much else, I think he provides a very good point there that Joe Manchin should listen to. And I just hope that with all of this, this highlights exactly why Manchin is an issue and why him representing a position of the Democrats while constantly talking about bipartisanship and playing this middle ground between this very right party and this other right-leaning, you know, liberal party, um, needs to be addressed. You know, at the end of the day, Manchin's going to be the scapegoat, the person that can leverage a conservative position of power. And he will be the person to stop things in the future. Even if he doesn't stop things now, even if he goes with the process and allows for this particular stim stimulus to get passed, he will be the person in the future that we look to quite the way that we had to look at McConnell earlier. So with that said, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and bell for notifications. You can follow me on Twitter or check out my Discord in the description down below. My name is Anarchist Tara, and I hope you enjoyed watching.